So people ask me why it's important, and they say that it's not life or death, but I think that that statement represents a fundamental breakdown of information, a significant misunderstanding about the power of education. Sexual education is the difference between life or death for millions of girls around the world. We live in a world that is decimated by gender-based violence. Following developing news from Orange County, where a high school teacher has been placed on leave over an anatomy lesson that some parents say was too sexually explicit. Republicans across the country, Jersey included, have been targeting local school curricula, which they say are promoting a radical agenda that exposes kids to sexuality and gender roles at an inappropriately young age. The law bans classroom instruction and conversation about sexual orientation and gender identity for public school students in kindergarten through third grade. It's important for children to know about their bodies and to protect themselves and to keep themselves safe. This is a violation of people's religious liberty. You want to inculcate morality in a way that does not violate religion and isn't creepy and perverse? Teach abstinence like you've always done. We'll make sure that parents can send their kids to school to get an education, not an indoctrination. An LGBTQ inclusive curriculum benefits all students and makes all schools safer because when LGBTQ students feel acknowledged and welcomed at school, all students benefit. In 1964, Calderon and five colleagues founded CECUS as the Sex Information and Education Council of the United States. The founding mission of the organization was to establish man's sexuality as a health entity to the end that human beings may be aided towards responsible use of the sexual faculty toward assimilation of sex into the individual life patterns as a creative and recreational force. Calderon later explained, sex is a part of total health. It doesn't belong to the church. It doesn't belong to the law. It belongs to you, the person. It's a part of total health and your personality structure. In the early days, CECUS published studies on sex education, masturbation, and homosexuality. To understand how revolutionary these early acts of simply talking about sex openly were, it's important to remember the effects of the Comstock laws, which targeted obscene materials were still being felt across the country, that access to contraception, even among married couples, remained illegal in some states until 1965, and that homosexuality was still considered a mental illness and homosexual sex was illegal in some states. Opposition to sex education was part of the backlash to shifting sexual values and what was seen as an overreach of schools by teaching about sex. Over the next few decades, social conservatives would wage countless local wars against sex education programs in attempts to divide communities and gain political power. However, these efforts never succeeded in the stated goal of removing sex education from schools entirely. By the 1970s, most people acknowledged that the country had undergone an all-out sexual revolution. The invention of the birth control pill had given women control over their own fertility in a way that had never happened before. Supreme Court decisions had legalized abortion and made birth control more readily available. This reproductive freedom gave women the ability to plan families, invest in their careers, and change the way many in society viewed premarital sex, relationships, and even marriage itself. Public opinion changed rapidly in just a few years. A 1969 poll found that 70% of Americans were opposed to premarital sex. But by 1973, that was down to just under 50%. Similarly, fewer people were offended by nudity in magazines and plays from three quarters to just over half. Even the percentage of who were offended by topless waitresses went down by 17%. On the flip side, the percentage of people who thought everyone who wanted birth control should have access to it went up by 10 points. And not surprisingly, there was a strong backlash to these changing values. In fact, by the mid-1970s, a cohesive movement known as the Christian Right had organized. Preventing teen pregnancy by promoting abstinence became one of the rallying cries of the Christian right that it has continued to use through present day. One of the central arguments around sex education has always revolved around whether sex education belonged in school. Over the years, whether they were railing against a social hygiene lecture, a FLE program, or the non-existent CECUS program, 
some opponents of sex education stuck to the position that this was a private matter that should only be discussed in homes and religious institutions. The AIDS epidemic and the panic it brought with it effectively put an end to this argument. The Reagan administration largely ignored the early AIDS epidemic because it was thought to be a problem limited to gay men, an already stigmatized group that had little political power. AIDS, the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, the disease known as AIDS. The disease AIDS. On the disease AIDS. While the introduction of a deadly SCI may have settled the debate over whether sex education belonged in school, it did little to resolve the many arguments about what should and should not be covered in such courses. SICUS and other organizations pushed for a comprehensive approach to sex education that covered health, development, and relationships in addition to contraception and disease prevention. But the Christian right continued to argue that this was much too much information, too soon, and it only further divorced sex from morality. In too many communities, fear-based lessons about HIV and AIDS became the only sex education that many of these young people in the communities received. AIDS triggered an intense activism that was shared by patients as well as medical staff. As Ronald Reagan took office in the early 1980s, he launched a full-out war on sex. The Reagan administration supported and funded abstinence programs that proliferated and persisted into today. Director Nussel, how can he justify continued funding for abstinence-only education programs, which have been proven to be highly ineffective? Well, I don't think they've proven to be highly ineffective. I think, again, there are differences of opinion when it comes to that. Uh, differences of opinion in, in the number of teen pregnancies in the exposure to uh, uh, sexually transmitted disease. Do, do you think that uh, we've been gaining on that? I haven't seen the statistics in, in the last number of days or, or months, but I can tell you that my, the last time I checked, I believe that teen pregnancy was actually down. During the 1984 primary season, Ronald Reagan worried publicly that Americans were having too much sex. I ticked a lot of people off that uh, refused to deal openly and honestly about the predicament of our children today. I feel that if you don't understand and can't control your reproduction, you can't control your life. We can break that cycle with sexual education. The way that women are treated in society stems from the way that we talk about sex, and we need to change the way that we talk about sex. In the 2000s, the abstinence-only programs focused on preventing promiscuous behavior in young women. Abstinence-only programs had been sold on the promise that they would prevent STIs and teen pregnancy. But the research began to show that they did neither. In 2007, a number of studies were published showing that abstinence-only programs did little to change young people's sexual behavior and could actually be damaging. In 1995, there was a book called time-tested secrets for capturing the heart of Mr. Wright that set the rules of dating for the next 20 years. In fact, you may know some of them today. They're don't talk to a man first, don't accept a Saturday night date after Wednesday, don't kiss him on a first date. It was essentially teaching young women how to play hard to get, and it definitely rolled back the movement of women liberation. Launching into the 21st century, the push and pull of the sex revolution and the sex counter-revolution continued. George W. Bush pushed abstinence-only programs for sex education, while Barack Obama seemed to favor more comprehensive sex education and even formed a group called the Office of Adolescents Health within the Department of Health and Human Services. This office is still alive today. In order for us to understand where our current culture wars are on sex and sex education, we have to understand the developments of the 20th century to see where we came from and to see the sexual revolution and the sexual counter-revolution that rose up and are still combative in today's political climate. We absolutely need comprehensive sex education in schools. We need young people to be learning and normalizing sexual behaviors and sexual health. But the right-wing conservatives are still pressing forward their agenda of attacking these sexual liberation values as being morally wrong and going against the traditional family values of the 
Catholic and Christian church. Always remember that the bowels of abstinence break far more easily than does latex condoms. When children learn about gender and about sex and about sexuality, parents learn as well. When we change the way that our society and our schools talk about gay marriage and about gender identity and about healthy relationships, we change the way that all of these things are framed in our society. It's a big leap, but we have to take that leap. And this is The Politics of Sex. I've been giving you the worst.